Good evening, and thank you for joining the Westerly Library in Wilcox Park for tonight's author talk. This program is being presented using the webinar version of Zoom, and attendees are joining in listening mode only. Please send any and all questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to answer all questions within the time we have allotted. Please note that this program is being recorded and we will post it on our YouTube channel as soon as possible. Should you get disconnected, simply use the link that was emailed to you earlier to get back into the program. I will now turn it over to our moderator for tonight, Friends Board Member Mary Weiss. Thank you very much, Amanda. And good evening to you all and welcome to this virtual author talk with Deborah Goodrich Royce, discussing her latest book, Ruby Falls, just released on May 4th of this year. We are extremely fortunate to have, to be one of the very first to talk with Deborah about her second novel, following her highly successful Finding Mrs. Ford. As Amanda said, my name is Mary Weiss. I am a member of the board of the Friends of the Western Library in Wilcox Park. The friends are collaborating with the library and bringing you this virtual event. Good evening, Deborah, and thank you for joining us this evening. Hi, Mary. Thank you so much for having me. Deborah and her husband, Chuck Royce, are very well known to the Westley community for their restoration of the iconic Ocean House. They have restored several other historic properties, both in Rhode Island, in Rhode Island and other states. Deborah is committing to supporting the local arts and theater including the United Theater here in Westerly. Among her many talents, Deborah is also establishing herself as a skilled writer of psychological thrillers. Drawing her own experience, she is now crafted for her second suspenseful, quick-paced Ruby Falls. I don't believe that the fans of Finding Mrs. Ford will be disappointed. Deborah began her professional career as an actress in New York City after her graduation from Lake Erie College in Ohio. Her first success as an actress came in All My Children, a soap opera in 1982-83. She played the fictional character Silver King, also known as Connie Wilkes, who was revealed to be a con artist. Deborah lived in Paris with her first son and two first husband and two daughters, where she analyzed books and scripts for investment by a French film studio. Deborah then moved back to New York City where she worked as a story editor for Miramax. She also worked in the film industry in Los Angeles. Deborah is the mother of two adult daughters, a grandmother, stepmother, and step-grandmother by her second husband, Chuck Royce. Because Ruby Falls is a story that unfolds in a series of secrets that are gradually revealed, culminating in a surprising ending, at least for me, I'll be careful to avoid any spoilers. Deborah, to be on the safe side, would you please give us a short synopsis of Ruby Falls so our audience has some context for our discussions, especially since your book was just released and many have not yet, many may not have yet read, read it. It would be my pleasure. So Ruby Falls, the title is very much a double entendre because Ruby Falls is a place it is a cave near Chattanooga, Tennessee, a tourist attraction. And the name of the little girl uh, who begins the story in that cave is Ruby. So it starts on a beautiful sunny day in July of 1968, but you are underground. You are not aware of that sunshine. And it is pitch black dark. Little Ruby is in Ruby Falls with her father and the tour guides have turned off the lights and she is terrified. Because it's a cave, she can't tell where the waterfall is. And the tour guide is talking about how divers have dived down, trying to find the bottom of this underground lake unsuccessfully. And this little girl is about as scared as she could get at the moment when her father lets go of her hand. And when the lights come back on, he's gone. And because it's 1968, there's a reason I said it in the time that I did. There are no cameras. There are no credit card records. The tour guides have this little six-year-old child. They don't know. I mean, obviously, she came into this cave with somebody, but they can't quite remember who. She's now alone. 
They don't know what to do with her. They take her upstairs. Eventually they call the police. The police keep her at the precinct until her mother calls that evening looking for her and her husband. And mother and daughter are grounded in Chattanooga, Tennessee for the rest of the summer. The mother is dealing with the police inquisition and the search for her husband. And the child is in a state of shock or, or PTSD, we would now call it. Okay. 20 years later, she's an actress. She has gotten rid of the name Ruby, which was her middle name. And she goes by Eleanor Russell. She's an actress on a soap opera in New York City. She loses her job under circumstances that are a little, mm, you can't tell, something's a little funny. She takes off for Europe. She meets a tall, dark, handsome stranger, <coughs> excuse me, by the name of Orlando Montague. And she marries him spontaneously. And they go to Rome and on a little honeymoon. And they're about to go down into the catacombs under the earth. And our girl, as you can imagine, has an attack of claustrophobia. She has to be escorted out and she knows it's right about the moment she should tell this new husband about what happened to her in her childhood, but she doesn't. So she starts the marriage with that secret. They go to Los Angeles, perfect cottage in the Hollywood Hills, just like a film set. And she's cast in a remake of the movie, Rebecca, based on the Daphne du Maurier book and the Hitchcock film. And at that point, when her life is just coming up roses in all ways, her husband starts to change and act a little strange. And you realize that she is not the only person in that marriage with a secret. And you're off to the races from there. Definitely. Most definitely. I can attest to that. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Amin if she could put up an image of the book cover and also a charming photograph of you with your father as a young girl at Ruby Falls. Well, while Amanda is putting the cover up, I'd like to focus a little bit on this cover because having read Finding Mrs. Ford, I have a sense that this cover has a story behind it. And I know a little bit about this production of this cover, but maybe you could talk about that. And then also the cover itself and what is depicted in the cover that you find may give us some clues about the story that you've just summarized for us. Well, one of the words I like to use to describe Ruby, Ruby Falls is Gothic. It is a Gothic book in the old fashioned sense of the word, like Jane Eyre, like Rebecca, like The Woman in White, like all those books we, we've all grown up loving. Gothic in that you have a damsel in distress. Oh, there we are. Oh, great. Thank you, Amanda. Wonderful. So you have a damsel in distress, a young and vulnerable woman who comes under the sway of a more powerful man who may or may not have her best interests at heart. I think that's one of the setups in a Gothic novel. So when you look at this cover, which the photographic work behind the cover was done by an artist named Melanie Wilhide, who's a Yale MFA. And she was doing a show in California when her computer was stolen. And the stolen computer, when the thief tried to swipe it, uh, when it was retrieved, this is one of the things that had happened to her photograph. So she created an exhibition all around that accident. But why it's so perfect for Ruby Falls, if you look very closely, you can see that the face of the girl is kind of coming apart up at the top in the upper, uh, I don't know my right from my left, the upper <laughs> right corner, you see her mouth. And then over to the left, you see her face tipped sideways and kind of uh, showing in strips. So what I love about the cover, I think it is both beautiful at first glance, and it's also very odd. There's something unsettling about it, which is, of course, 
the Gothic setup. You think about Rebecca, the house Manderley. It's beautiful, but it's strange. It's spooky. So I think it was really a very happy circumstance for me that this cover came along. It is getting fantastic response. And bookstores, you know, for many of the bigger bookstores, it is my understanding that publishing houses have to pay to have the front of a book faced out toward the, uh, you know, the aisle. Mm -hmm. And a lot of bookstores are facing this book out because she's so pretty. Well, what I focused on, some of the things you've just mentioned, but were the young girl's eyes. And they seem to be of different color. They seem to be looking at different directions. Was that just, once again, this accident or this theft that caused the um, pictures to be distorted? Or can we see something else in these eyes? Well, I think you see her vulnerability and her pain. I think the photographer, uh, has used makeup around one eye of the young model. I know the model is her niece and her name's Daisy. Although this photograph is called Grace and Thorns. And I think that sort of gives you a feeling of, of something that is both sublime and <laughs> painful. So I, I think it was makeup that created it, but it is part of this unsettling look. Like, what was she hit what uh what what's going on with with her eyes it is it's strange looking well definitely the cover draws you in and you say to yourself what's going on here i want to learn more the picture uh as i'm looking at my computer on the left of you and your father is quite charming uh, can you guess about how old you were when you were there with your father i'm gonna say i was maybe eight and i've created uh the story around a six and a half year old child i don't know how old I am. You know, children, my legs look long, but I can see that I'm up on my toe. How this photo was discovered was very meaningful to me. Talk about happy accidents. In November, the book was almost going to print, not quite, you know, final edits, copy edits, read it over again and over. I got a letter from a director I'd worked with when I was an actress who had read a galley of Ruby Falls and really loved it. And I was saying to a friend how meaningful it was because I said, you know, my father, he died when I was 19. So he doesn't know anything I've ever accomplished. And of course, he'll never see Ruby Falls. I went to a storage unit later that day looking for, you know, that famous box of baby clothes you boxed up 30 years ago? Right. You better get out now or your grandchild will never get into those baby clothes. That's what I was looking for. And I saw another box of papers. And this photograph was right on top. Now, I do remember going to Ruby Falls with my parents. I do not remember this photograph being taken. I don't remember ever seeing it. So I, 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 was very teary because I felt it was a little heavenly wink from dear old dad saying, I see you. You don't think I see you, but I see you. So I emailed my publisher right away and we were able to put it in the back of the book. Excellent. Well, it really is quite a charming picture. And I assume that you're able to write this chilling description of going into the cave based upon some memory you have of your trip there. Ruby Falls scared me so badly. I, in my memory, they turned off every light. I cannot imagine that they would have done that because wouldn't the people have fallen in or maybe we weren't that close to the water. All I remember was that sensation of being under the earth with no sense of where a waterfall was making its noise and this woman saying that it was imminent death if you fell in, fell in there. And that, that's my, <laughs> that was my takeaway. So oh, I, I guess it made an impression on me. Well, you mentioned a little bit earlier when we started our discussion this evening, uh, the title of the book, Ruby Falls. And um, you talked about it being a physical place. And you talked about the name of the young girl who's featured in the book. But is there something also we should focus on the word falls? We, we know there's water in the falls, yes. but it is, is it 
is it more of an emotional, psychological fall that we're talking about here? Absolutely. I love words and I play with words through the entire book, uh, the chapter names. And definitely it is a reference to the act of falling, uh, emotionally falling, that sensation of being unstable. So it is a play on words in really three different ways. Many different ways. But you also touched upon the fact that this book has autobiographical elements to it. And this was something that you did so skillfully in finding Mrs. Ford. Um, this whole character that you played in the soap opera, and I have to admit, I wasn't watching too many soap operas in the eighties. Um, she too had a secret. So did you pick up on that idea? I know you had the secret idea in finding Mrs. Ford as well, but that Silver Lake, I think Silver Kane character and her secrets, was that something you picked up for our Eleanor in Ruby Falls? Absolutely, yes. I am fascinated by those kinds of secrets, the things that people reveal versus what they conceal. I think we all conceal things. Most of us conceal very benign elements of ourself. But, you know, occasionally there are people we meet whose secrets are of uh, a, a greater magnitude. So that intrigues me. And on a soap opera, I was playing a little bit with that. There are uh, soap operas revolve around secrets and the revelation of them or the endless keeping of them. And uh, I, I just, I, I find that intriguing in, in a plot, those, those little puzzles that you get to put together. Well, I know it's sort of a maxim of writing uh, that you should know what, write about what you know. So I think you've taken that maxim and incorporated in both your books, especially Ruby Falls. But you could have set this uh, anywhere. I mean, Hollywood didn't have to be the place where you chose. Why did you choose that? I think of Hollywood, and I don't know it very well, as a place of stories, of, of careers, of people who live one life and actually are another. That's what this whole Cary Grant book was about, the when he had the author in the beginning of our author series this year. Um, so was that an element that in, you tried to introduce in the book as well? Very much so. I arrived in Hollywood after I had done all my children. I was flown out there by Paramount Pictures, my first studio. I think I was flown coach, but never mind. It was lovely. And I was put up in the, the Hollywood Holiday Inn, which I thought was very snazzy. It was very <laughs> nice. And I remember going onto that lot, uh, going under those gates. And it was really iconic. I was a real movie fan as a child. I grew up in the era where there were, uh, in Michigan, if you stayed home from school, there was a, a movie on in the morning on television. There weren't obviously all these channels. There were Saturday afternoon movies. So I watched a lot of movies. When I moved to Los Angeles, my dear girlfriend went with me and my girlfriend, Anna Martinez. And the book is dedicated to four people with whom I was very close at that time. They have all died. Mm -hmm. And Anna and I went there together and we came across this book, which really wasn't much more than a pamphlet. And it was called Haunted Hollywood. And you think about what Carl Hyacin, I think it was Carl Hyacin said about Florida, a sunny place, for shady people. So that juxtaposition of a perfect exterior, because Los Angeles is very sparkly, very brilliantly sunny, but there's a seedy underbelly. And in this haunted Hollywood, Anna and I went everywhere. We went to the house where Houdini lived. We went to the place where Sal Minio died. We went to just on and on and on. So I've always had a fascination with that aspect of Hollywood. You think of the film Noirs or Sunset Boulevard. It is, it's a thing. And I like to write place as, as you know, with Finding Mrs. Ford, I wanted to write Watch Hill as it is, as a place. I wanted to write Detroit as it was at that moment in 1979. Hollywood, I wanted to write as I remember it in the 1980s, because I think place is almost like character. And when, when I'm reading a book and the author is describing places I know or even places I don't know, I'm either thrilled 
when I recognize it or I'm excited, like Shadow of the Wind set in Barcelona. I've never been to Barcelona, but just reading that book, I, it's on my list. I want to go to Barcelona. I want to see the places as they were written. So for me, it could have been set anywhere, but in Rebecca, and this is obviously not a rewrite of Rebecca, but it's a flight of fancy from many of the ideas in that book. Manderley was essential. The first sentence is about Manderley. If she dreamt, she went back there. And I wanted to write a Hollywood almost like a dream because I lived there so long ago. One more point and I'll come off of it. I left Hollywood sort of at a peak moment in my career in youth. I just left. I moved to Paris with my first husband. Several friends died. My agent died. Uh, my friend Lisa died. My friend Anna died within a decade. And my then boyfriend Grant died. These people were part of my life. So when I went back to Hollywood, when I had a daughter move there in 2015, it was emotionally wrenching. So I've lived here in, in Connecticut and I've been in Westerly for the past 20 years. I don't have emotional turmoil every time I see the Savoy bookstore or Sandy's market, because I go there all the time. So going back to a place though, it, it's very striking if, years have gone by and, and it was then and people have died. And so I was very overwrought for a while. I think my daughter thought I was a bit of a nut because I would see these places and say things like, oh, Tess, that old house, that arts and crafts house, that's where your pediatrician was. And she'd say, yeah, mom, all right, all right. So I'm over that now. I can be in, in Hollywood without <laughs> all the drama. But and that was when I was starting this book. So I think that flavor permeates the book, one of loss. Well, I felt, and I don't know much about Hollywood. I felt I really knew the Hollywood Hills after reading that. Uh, your book. <laughs> um, one of the things in the psychological thriller is pacing. And I've noticed that your writing style now in these two books is just so good about that. It's fast paced. The reader's like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen next? Because you know something's going to happen next, probably something you hadn't anticipated. Did your earlier career in um, screenwriting, being involved in uh, the film industry, help you develop this style? Because I think of it's like a movie script, but maybe I've got that wrong. You've got it so right, Mary. Yes. Uh, and I was not so much writing as I was editing the work of other people. And I think many writers do begin their careers as editors because it's a... Um, it's a mentally clarifying process. If you have to tell your bosses what works about this and what doesn't work, you really have to hone your understanding of what works and what doesn't work with story, with plot, with pace, with character. You really, and I think structurally, um, I always think of my novels in, in three acts, like a movie, and I think of them with a midway point as, as kind of the markers of sections that kind of contain a rhythm, come to a point of high interest and then go on from there. And I don't know if that's proper, but that's how I do it. Well, I think another very difficult aspect of writing that I think you've achieved quite well is writing in the first person narrative because we are Eleanor, we are experiencing these events as she is experiencing them. And I was wondering how difficult it is to write like that, or do you become Eleanor as you're writing? Well, a little bit you do, and that's like acting. You know, people ask, you know, well, how do you write things you don't know? How do you act things you don't know? First of all, you know everything really you know the full range of human emotion. You have felt everything. You have felt anger, you have felt jealousy, you felt love and lust and coveted, covetousness and on and on and on. You felt some version, you haven't felt it to the extreme maybe. So when, so let's talk about first person writing. And I, it was very important to me to write this book in the first person 
The my first novel, Finding Mrs. Ford, is not. My third novel alternates between a third person and a first person narrative. I think, yes. So for Ruby slash Eleanor, it was not hard for me to get into her head. I have not led her life to the extremes that she has. Nobody left me in the cave. <laughs> but I was able to call up my full, you know, fan deck of emotions to really get into it. And I thought with, with this story, like, like Rebecca, it was a first person story. And going back to names with Rebecca, that heroine never had a name, which was a really interesting choice. Rebecca was the name of uh, uh, her husband's Max de Winter's first wife. My character has two names. She has Ruby, she has Eleanor. So it's a little bit of a, you know, playing with that identi identity issues. Well, she did have some identity problems, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> One of the other things that is so um, gripping about this book of yours is sort of the half-truths and the omissions. And we begin to develop a storyline and then it changes. And then the dimension of it becomes something else. And then it goes along for a while and becomes something else. How did you keep all that straight? I mean, did I tell my reader about this or now I'm gonna go over in this direction? I mean, that seems also very difficult. I chart things out. I, I don't do an outline like I did when I was in college where I have, you know, number one and section A, B, C. I don't do it like that, but I do just do streams of notes and bullet points and I, I type them out. I do write on my computer and then I look at it again and I write on it and I make notes. I'm I wake all night long. I don't know how many other people do that. I think some people do. So I have a pad of paper and a pen next to the bed. The question is, can I read what I've written down <laughs> in the middle of the night? That's always another thing. So it was harder keeping track of finding Mrs. Ford because that's a non-linear story and it's non-linear twice. That story goes back and forth between two decades comes to a crescendo, and then it repeats another look at those two decades. That I had to really make sure that if there's a moment when you're supposed to see these glasses, but not before, I mm -hmm. had to then do a completely linear timeline for that. With Ruby Falls, I didn't have as much of a non-linear aspect, but I had certain keys and codes and references that I would check myself on. I always do a lot of research. And one of the things, Ruby, with the dis disappearance of her father, it's the 1960s when it happens. And because her name's Ruby, she becomes a little bit fixated on the Kennedy assassination. And did her father give her that name because he knew Jack Ruby? Was mm -hmm. there some tie or the CIA or the KGB or, or the Cubans or this, crazy thing called the Dixie Mafia. I read two books about that. So I think that was interesting to, to, you know, as she's searching for a reason for why on earth her father would leave her in a cave. All of that is real. The things that I put in that she's examining, those are real things. Well, it was interesting also the structure of the book. See, I'm trying to stay away from the spoilers about the content of the book. Um, you have short chapters. You have 47 chapters in about 300 pages. So is there, because we don't have long attention spans anymore, or you're trying to achieve something in each chapter, what is the purpose of having these short chapters? It's probably my cinematic thinking, maybe my television thinking, you know, in soap operas, you always end on that cliffhanger, da 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 da, and the two people are looking at each other, mm -hmm. and then you pick it up again. So I like that cliffhanger ending. And I have found that with people who read my books, they very much responded to it. They say that they're in bed at night and they just say, one more, one more, one more, yes, one more. Yes, and yes, yes, yes. That way. So Structurally, though, you've, you've brought up a really interesting thing. In the first book, because it goes back and forth and back and forth, I originally switched every chapter 
for a timeline, 14, 79, 14, 79. And I had a terrific editor who suggested, she said, keep your short chapters. People love them. Cluster them though. Do three in one era and okay. four in another era. So that's what I did in that book. And I think it was very effective. You still had that, that galloping feeling, but you, mm -hmm. you could adhere more to one era or another. That was not applicable in this book. Well, also these chapter titles are interesting. Now, I don't think I'm near the movie buff that you are, uh, but I did recognize some of these movies. And I'm trying to think of, well, is what the movie about what's going on in the chapter or is that just sort of a, a name? So is there a connection between the chapter title and the movie if a movie name is being used or did you just find that a good title? There is, they're not all movies. Some are television shows, some are quotations, some are just extracts of uh, pieces of music. Uh, so I enjoyed that. I think it, it is a literary puzzle. If you enjoy that sort of thing and you recognize it or you wanna look it up, it's fun. But I don't think it's a deterrent to the enjoyment of the book if people don't want to. Well, I was trying to do that. I, I, the only one that really popped out at me was Fatal Attraction. I think Fatal all Attraction was one, The Day of the Locust, <laughs> which was one of those uh, early films set in, well, it was a film made post-war, but set in pre-war Hollywood. Uh, I used Dark Shadows. I used The Red Shoes. I used... Um, oh, The Postman Always Rings Twice. Yes, everything has a little clue to what's going on in the chapter, but a tiny wink. It's well, that's not, good, because I'm not, not sure I clocked them all. all. Than a tiny wink. The Postman Always Rings Twice. I used that chapter name, one, because I love the movie. And there's something in the scene where a character comes to the door. That's yeah. really okay. um, as much as it is. Well, there's this overall Gothic theme that you mentioned when we you first summarized the book for us and film noir. So do a lot of these movies have that same Gothic context to them? of horror and mystery. No, there. well, oh, let me pull it up. I've got the book right here. So some of them do, many of them do. Um, so, well, that's uh, Thalia and Melpomene is a title of chapter three. And Thalia and Melpomene are those uh, dramatic masks of the smiling face, and the, fr uh, the frowning face. They are the masks oh. of comedy and tragedy. And it's a chapter where she talks about, she first reveals to you that she's an actress. So if, if you follow that, Sweet Dreams, that's a reference to a song. As the World Turns, a reference to a soap opera. A right. Raven and a Writing Desk, Edgar Allan Poe, and so on. Uh, and it goes on that way. So they're fun little things if they're of interest. Well, I guess we could use a brain teaser too. Um, you mentioned also earlier on um, the film Rebecca and the book by Dauphin de Meillet. And I just wanted to remind our audience if you had um, attended our second book series, author series this year that we had Christina Lane who talked about Joan Harrison. And Joan Harrison was the screenwriter for um, Rebecca. And I just wanted the audience to be aware, if you're not, that um, Christina Lane just got a very prestigious award for that book from the Mystery Writers of America. So we were very thrilled and I congratulated her on it. She was excited that she got it. She's an academic, so she wrote a biography and it really uh, does well. It talks a lot about women in the film industry and how difficult it was in the 30s and 40s, but how successful Joan Harrison was. Um, but looking at the, the book, and the movie, Rebecca, are there characteristic similarities between the, the characters in the movie and the book of Rebecca and Eleanor in, in your book? Yes, I think the heroines in both versions of Rebecca, the heroine and our heroine, they're extremely vulnerable, sensitive young women. And in each case, they marry a man 
they do not know, which is a very strange life choice. And in Rebecca, uh, the young heroine is without really family ties that you know of. She is working as a, a, travel, a paid companion for an older woman, but you never really hear about her family. In Ruby Falls, you do hear very much about uh, Eleanor's family, her mother is still alive, but she does marry Orlando without speaking to her mother. So each of the characters traveling in Europe make a spontaneous decision to marry a man that they don't know. And I think that, boy, that's a recipe for <laughs> trouble, for drama, for something to happen. And from there, each of the characters starts to, uh, the husband's behavior changes. The husband goes from being kind, gentle, and solicitous to being prickly and reactive and not always kind and- Secretive. Secretive, and the young women start to question if there is, if they've, you know, what have I done? Uh, well, they don't really do that. They don't, maybe we would do more of that. They're, they don't really pull away from the marriage, but they can't grasp on to what's going on. So I think those setups are very similar. And the place, Los Angeles replacing Manderley. Well, it's interesting though in the book that our main character, Eleanor, thinks of herself more as Mrs. Danvers in the book and the movie film, Rebecca, than she does as the heroine. I'll kind of leave it at that so our readers uh, we can't give them a spoiler, but I thought that was an interesting comment by Eleanor of who she thinks she is more similar to. Um, we talked a lot about the imagery in your book of the caves. And I think that uh, we've talked about that. I think our uh, audience will understand that. But there are a few others that I thought were interesting as well. <laughs> and one was pieces of paper. Mm. And Eleanor talks about these pieces of paper as being, uh, what did she use? It was a very interesting phrase you chose for that. Memory ticklers. Mm -hmm. Now I know that I write a lot of notes to myself these days. Um, I remember my mother used to do that. So I'm like, okay, maybe that's a phenomenon of a certain age, but what what's the significance of these pieces of paper that, sh that keep reoccurring in the book? Well, there's a through line. Some of them I will not speak about because they would be spoilers, but I will okay. tell one story. In, I, I can't remember exactly where it is in the book, but there's a dinner where uh, a dinner guest, Eleanor is at a dinner in New York and someone else at the dinner tells kind of a spooky, ominous uh, story warning Eleanor to get in the habit of slipping a little piece of paper into the door jam of her house every time she goes out so that if she ever comes home and that piece of paper has fallen, do not go into the house. Well, that came, someone said that to me once and it just scared me. <laughs> I've never forgotten it. Uh, and it was probably a very ill-advised thing to say to somebody at a dinner party. It was so peculiar. and. Honestly, to this day, there are times where I go to the door, I don't keep a piece of paper in the door, but I think, should I have put a piece of paper in the door? So I just took that and used it in the book because I thought it was so spot on for Eleanor and the other pieces of paper that we can't really talk about because they are spoilers. Um, but they are, it is, a, it is a thing. And she does, yeah, it all comes together, all of that. Well, you do talk about numerology in your book. And I also wanted to remind our readers of the other friends uh, presentation we had with a local woman, Hillary Klotz Steinman, uh, on her documentary about um, Elizabeth Smith Friedman, who was one of the foremost code breakers in World War II. She also brought the mob to their knees in, in prohibition. And you use numerology in your book. Now, I don't want to have a spoiler here, but you know, I sat there trying to figure out that code myself before, you know, you gave it to us. And I thought, well, I can do this. This will be quite simple. And I got like nowhere with it. So did you come up with the place 
if I'm not saying too much, and then put the numbers there? Or did you come up well, with yeah. the numbers and then put the Probably place? we shouldn't say too much about that. Yeah, um, right. Yeah, place first, place okay. first. Okay. But I had a friend years ago in LA who was very interested in numerology. And I don't really do numerology, but I always think about it. Uh, I always think if I'm buying a house, I think in numerology, it, it's all supposed to come to an odd number, not an even number. But I don't know if you can just take the numbers of your house when you do it. You're really supposed to take the letters of the house address. But then do you add the town and the state and the zip code? I don't really do it, but uh, people do. Well, I like to have the number seven in my address in my houses, and I've been pretty successful in doing that. Um, there is, and just stop me again, because I don't want to spoil anything. Um, this obsessive desire by Eleanor, it seemed to me, to break that code. And unlike me, who spent maybe five minutes trying to do it, she spent years in doing that. And what was she trying to, was she trying to reconnect to her father? Did she thought, well, maybe he's gonna to speak to her in some way, or she just had this obsession with this mm. number. Yeah, and I mean, that's really part of kind of the final conclusion of the book. So we probably shouldn't say too much about it, but yes, it's all about her father. Everything okay. about her father. Well, I, I think I've done a lot of talking here. Hopefully you've done more. I think you have. It's been very entertaining, but this is the point where I'm gonna ask Amanda if there are any uh, questions for our audience, because I do have a couple of follow-on questions uh, if after the audience asks theirs, if they don't ask them, so okay. Amanda. Sure, Deborah. Um, Stacy writes, as an advocate for libraries, I was thrilled that you have made a seemingly all-knowing and important character in the book, A Library Volunteer. I also loved Ele that Eleanor Ruby must get to the library at a time when she is searching for answers. Can you speak to the connection you made between libraries and searching for answers or a sense of belonging? Absolutely. What's the safest place in any town you move to is the library. What's the first place you wanna go? It's the library. It's, I remember those mind bending days of having a, a baby, a toddler at home and thinking, what am I gonna do all day? Put her in the stroller and go to the library. <laughs> you know, what's greater than the library? And <clears throat> so this book has been optioned by a Hollywood producer and it's not a deal deal. It's called a shopping agreement, which means He's trying to get a studio attached. And he asked me if I, what would I think if somebody wanted to make the story more contemporary to now? And it's a little bit tricky because Eleanor is, does spend a tremendous amount of time going down these research rabbit holes. Um, and I think nowadays, it's less interesting if she's on the internet all the time and you start, I mean, that's a whole kettle of fish that I, I would hope that's not what happens. I just love that she goes to a real library and that is, that is a real library there in Hollywood where she goes and sees her friend and goes to the section she's interested in. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, Lori writes, Deborah, with your background in film, has Finding Mrs. Ford been optioned for a movie? And what about Ruby Falls, which also sounds very cinematic? I just ordered it, but haven't yet read it. Thank you. Yeah, they both have been, but in the similar way, I have shopping agreements with two, uh, two women producers for, for Finding Mrs. Ford and a man for Ruby Falls. There's an actress who is oh, this close to signing for Finding Mrs. Ford, but I can't say it's not a done deal. And um, I can't do cartwheels anymore, but I might do a cartwheel or two if if that all happens. But you know, these things take time. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions at the moment. Uh, we definitely encourage anyone who has any questions, just go ahead and leave them in the Q&A at the bottom. Well, I do have one follow-up question because it's one that I think I hear a lot uh, when authors are interviewed and it's your writing process because I know that you're a very busy gal and you travel a lot and you have different places to go and come. So do you have like, okay, it's eight in the morning, I'm gonna get up, I'm gonna do my writing. Okay, now it's noon, I go on and do something else. Or are you more spontaneous? I 
think you referred to making notes at your bedside. So do you have a, a way that you engage in your writing, you have a room that you use, a process that you follow? So yeah, I'm very Pavlovian that way. I have a spot I like to sit. And when I sit in that spot, I feel inspired. Uh, because my life is busy, because I have a lot of other responsibilities, one of the ways I've written for many years is to schedule time. I don't just leave it loose because in an younger years, I left it more loose and I just never got it done. So I schedule time. I schedule three to five, five hour blocks where I sit where I normally sit and I turn off my cell phone and I turn off my emails and I write. This past year of COVID though, I did have longer stretches of time every day. So I am editing now a third book. Can you give us any hint about what that book may involve? Yeah. It is two narratives. It takes place in Palm Beach, Florida. Oh. In the height of the pandemic last year, the height of the shutdown. And it is the story of a lonely writer who's living alone and a woman researching the murder of her mother's best friend, which is an unsolved crime. My mother's best friend was murdered when my mother was 12 in Pittsburgh, which has always been in my mind, but this is fictionalized. And at the same time, it's the story of a young woman whose husband and children disappear in the middle of the pandemic and how these stories intersect of the writer and the wife. Well, I hope you get it out soon because I'm already intrigued and I want to read it as soon as possible. Um, I, are there any more questions, Amanda? Yes. Um... Lori has asked, I will go further with the film option topic. Have you considered writing the screenplay yourself for either book? And what is your new third book about? Yeah, I don't think I'm a strong enough screenwriter. It, the mechanics of screenplays and the structure and I, although I did a tremendous amount of editing of screenplays and I have written one myself, I just don't feel that I'm strong enough. And I don't think anyone's offering it to me. I think for this to happen, either one of them, they would bring in a bigger name screenwriter, at which point I become the least important person in the whole scenario. So that's kind of funny and humbling because these characters that came completely out of my little brain will go off and be who knows what. Let's hope they don't put in juggling clowns <laughs> or some other crazy thing. And the third book, yeah, I just talked about that. And right now I'm calling that Reef Road. It's the name of a street on the north end of Palm Beach. I like the name. A lot of the action takes place there. And it sounds, Reef Road sounds a little bit dangerous, like you could just run aground at any moment on a reef. So that's what it's called right now. Thank you, Deborah. Um, we don't have any more questions at the moment, Mary. Well, I think that this has been a, a fun evening. Thank you so much, Deborah, and uh, welcome once again to the library. I know that when the third book comes out, we'll be knocking on your door and seeing if you can join us again. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Mary. You have great questions. It's, it's been a delight. Bye, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thanks.